Okay, here I am, here I am, here I am. Good morning, people. Oh my gosh, can I say I'm ridiculously late this morning getting on? I am. I was not going to come on because I am pressed for time. I have a speaking engagement this morning. I had to get my son ready this morning. It's just too much this morning, but I'm here. I'm here and I'm waiting for you guys to come on because we're going to continue with that chapter and then I'm out. I'm going to leave you like a bad habit and I'm going to be on my way. I thank you guys so much for your patience, your love and your support. We are still talking about money and relationships because we are reviewing the book Financial Love Making by Dr. Boyce Watkins. Now I'm going to say this. I spoke to him yesterday and um, I told him I was reading his book. And he started to laugh and he said, oh my God, I wrote that book when I was 34 years old before I had any real experience writing books. And it was like one of those things where you're younger and you just say whatever you want to say off the cuff. That's that book. And I just started laughing because I told him I enjoyed the book no matter what. So um, I'm going to share the link with you guys of how you guys can purchase this book as well. But this book has a lot of jewels in it for those in relationships, especially those who are struggling with a partner whether male or female, who has bad money management or bad spending habits or whatever the case is. If you are not building to win, if you are not building wealth in your relationship, I suggest that you re-examine your relationship goals when it comes to money and building a future. So we're about to get started. So good morning. Yes, I was here. I know. I know. My gosh. Thank you so much, Empire. I apologize. I apologize. Empire, let me just share the video. We're going to get started. I do apologize, but I have to take care of the kids and the kids come first and you already know how that goes. So that's about it. Let's gonna, we're going to get started and hopefully people just know that we're on here and they'll jump on. And if not, you know, they can always catch it on the replay, right? No big deal. So let's get started. So yesterday we left off with financial sex comparison number four, and that was you must trust your partner. So yesterday we talked about trust. Today when we talk about money management, we're talking about financial sex comparison number five. Each partner must bring something good to the table in order for the experience to be enjoyable. Right. So those of you guys who are new to this, we are reading Dr. Boyce Watkins financial love making book. And what he is doing is comparing sexual love making to finances. And if, like I said yesterday, and the day before yesterday is it's a weird way of how he does it. But if you listen, he drops so many jewels when it comes to getting in relationship with someone before examining their portfolio, their financial portfolio, financial po portfolios does not only have to be. Um, dollars, like cash, something tangible. We have to look at the bigger picture. And that's what he's talking about in this book. So let's move on. Financial comparison number five. Each partner must bring something, to the, something good to the table in order for the experience to be enjoyable. As in physical sex, financial sex can be terrible if your partner isn't bringing anything good to the table. Physical sex, for some, implies that the individual with whom you are sharing your body must be attractive in some way. And some would even argue bring specific skills with him or her to enhance the quality of your lovemaking process. The necessary pieces of, a, of good financial and physical love depend on the situation of one's particular needs. Some prefer that their financial lovemaking partner bring a certain degree of endowment. A large endowment means you have a large amount of financial resources. A well-endowed individual might be more enjoyable for a number of reasons, and I won't necessarily go there right now. Of course, a strong financial endowment can reduce financial problems in a relationship. While money doesn't necessarily buy happiness, I would argue that a lack of money gives you just one more thing to argue about. And it's true. Money isn't the end all be all in a relationship, but a relationship that has a lack of money will bring about a lot of chaos, arguments, disappointments, people threatening to leave the relationship. Not having money in a relationship can cause more stress than you would ever believe if you never experienced it. And those who have experienced it know exactly what I'm talking about. 
So good money management is very important because it can ruin a relationship. Good morning, Sakia. Good morning, Vanessa. Good morning, Oneed. Yay, you guys are on. Sorry I'm late, booze. All right, let's move on. Of course, as in physical sex, there are other pros and cons to having a well-endowed partner. Since they say that it's not the size of the ship, but it's the motion of the ocean. Sometimes that ain't true, but we ain't talking about that here today. So perhaps it's not the size of someone's wallet that makes financial lovemaking enjoyable. It is the way they manage the finances they have available. The ability to maxim to get maximal enjoyment out of minimum resources is an important part of money management. Yes, it is. And I want to say this. Oftentimes, good morning, Sister Marva. Good morning, Yvette. Yvette, how are you doing? I'm so glad you're back. I want to say this. Your, your, your partner doesn't have to have a ton of money in order for a relationship to work financially, right? But no matter what, you got to be able to bring something to the table, even if your money is low. What are you doing to really compensate for that shortfall? You can't come to the table with no money and want to spend all of your partner's money. And I don't care whether you're male or female, you have to bring something to the table. And that's for you and your partner to decide. But the point here is, if you have somebody that you're in a relationship with, and they're not really bringing it to the table to help you survive, you guys are going to have a lot of tension in your relationship. I mean, I know I'm speaking to the choir. Many of us have already experienced this in our relationships. It is so important that if you don't make a substantial amount of money, that you have excellent money management skills, that you can budget a money like no other. You can't make $5 an hour and then want to have $200 pair of sneakers. It just doesn't work that way. And somebody who is coming to a relationship with $5, but they want $200 worth of sneakers. They're going to put you $150 or $195 in debt. You understand? That person has to say, I want that, but I can't afford that. Or I want that. What else can I do to increase the money coming into the household so that I can be able to get it? For you to turn around and just say, can I have it so that I can get it? And you're not bringing anything to the table. That's going to cause a lot of stress and disappointment. So pretty much what he's saying is you don't want somebody who's going to be like that. The size of the wallet don't matter. There are people who make $200,000, $300,000 a year and they have poor money management skills. That too can upset a relationship because you're living beyond your means and you ain't got the money. Or you may have the money, but you're spending it on other things other than your responsibilities. So we have to really look at the total portfolio of the person that we are getting into a relationship with because if they're going to put us in debt, if they're going to stress us out, if, if we're going to be starving, trying to survive, we can do bad all by ourselves. Who needs a relationship like that? So that's pretty much what we're examining here. Hey, good morning, Justin. How are you? Therefore, as part of your financial lovemaking, you are going to want to bond with someone who not only has something to work with, but they know how to work with what they got. Somebody who knows how to live within their means and budget and budget. Somebody that's not a spender and broke. How are you broke and you spending everybody's money? That ain't none of my business. I'm going to move on. Financial sex comparison number six. You can get burnt if you are not careful. Now, y'all know in a lovemaking world, when we say burnt, we know we're talking about STD, STI. We know what we're talking about. But in money, you can get burnt as well if you're not careful. So people who are getting into relationships and they're not having money conversations, I oftentimes scratch my head when I listen to some people and you didn't know about the finances before you got in a relationship with them. I, I, I scratch my head about that because you got to know what you're getting into. You can't just be hooking up with somebody because they look good. doesn't work that way. So I see my video is lagging. Let me, got, let me know, guys, if y'all can hear me. Let me know if y'all can still hear me. I see the video is lagging and I don't know why it's plugged directly into my box. But um, y'all just let me know if y'all can hear me just by talking to me. So you can get burnt if you're not careful. I've heard, a, I've heard story after story of someone who fell in a financial love or partner with the wrong person and ended up regretting it for the rest of their life. This might come from a bad financial relationship with a mate, a business partner, or a relative. The consequences can be devastating. Here in this book, he shared a story of a lady 
who um, she had dropped out of college so that she can help her husband pursue his education. And he eventually became a very successful doctor. They had three children. They bought a house. All this great stuff they used to do together. And she was just home taking care of the kids. And one day when he got older, you know, these men, when they get older, they always want somebody younger. But he woke up and he decided he wanted someone younger. And so he left her. And even if you don't know anybody personal like this, we know that there are countless, a ton of movies that exhibit the same type of scenario, like that movie Waiting to Excel, with Angela Bassett at the beginning, where she said, I gave you 11 years. But the difference is, with this person here, the story that he's telling, this person had no education. She gave up her education in order for her husband to succeed. And then he turned around and left her, and she fell apart. She fell into depression because she had no money. She had no skill set. She had nothing to survive outside of him. That's not a good move. That's not very smart. That's not something you necessarily want to do. So what he's saying is there must not only be a tremendous trust. There are times when we must protect ourselves even from those who truly love us. There are also times when we must protect ourselves from ourselves. That is the tricky part. This example also reflects the fact that making good financial love to someone requires that we love ourselves. So in this case right here, loving herself would have been completing her education as well. Loving herself would have been setting aside a stream of income for herself, just in case he picked up to leave. And in 2017, when you get with somebody very successful, you better believe nine out of 10 times just signing a prenuptial agreement. So before you put your signature on that dotted line, you got to assess your own financial portfolio to determine if you have enough to survive should something go awry. There's nothing worse than getting in a relationship that you wasn't expecting to end. And when it ends, you are asked out. I counsel women all the time who are in relationships that they are miserable in. There is no sex. There is no conversation. There is no emotional connection. There is no affection. There are no date nights. This is a person who just feels like the husband comes home, eats and go to bed and don't talk to her. And you're living like this 20 years. You're living like this 28 years, 30 years, 15 years, even one year. It's a lot to live in that kind of situation. And when I examine the reason for why you don't leave, when we put aside the children, especially when the children are adults, when I examine why aren't you leaving this relationship is because the person had no backup plan. They have no education. They have no skill set. They have no money. So that person has become a control over them. One of my Facebook friends that I adore so much, we converse often just to check on each other. She had tagged me in somebody's online thing. And I think it's called the wife school or something like this. And this person had posted all this stuff about wife rules, but basically saying that a wife should stay home and take care of the kids. And I get the person's argument, but it's flawed. It's flawed. Because you cannot guarantee that your partner, either male or female, is going to hold up their end of the stick. You don't know if they're going to withhold or, 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 or hold up or agree to their bargain and stick to it. You don't know if that's going to happen. So you take a risk. And for you to get into a relationship with no skill set, no education, and no finances, you could be setting yourself up to get burnt. So we have to really think before we get into relationships and we have to really think bigger than what we're seeing on paper. Yeah, it's cool to be married to a surgeon. It's cool to be married to a dentist. That's cool. It's cool to be married to an attorney, a lawyer. What I mean, a lawyer and attorney is the same thing, but you get my point. That's cool, but not when your behind is broke. It's just like going into the NFL, dropping out of college to go into the NFL and play, and then you get cut three years later. That those A lot of NFL players don't have long careers in the NFL. Dropping out and you spent all your money because you had bad money management. Now you broke. And you have no skill set. You have no backup plan. And you weren't even a good player. 
You're broke. What are you going to do? So not only do we need good financial money management, we also have to have a backup plan. It doesn't necessarily have to be a college degree, but it has to be some type of skill set that you can earn money from if you ever find yourself partnered with the wrong person. Financial sex comparison number seven. Cheating can be devastating. Cheating can be devastating. Just like in a sexual relationship, cheating can bring you so many things, including diseases that are not curable. When it comes to finances, cheating, we're going to talk about that, can be devastating. Financial infidelity is similar to sexual infidelity. Financial infidelity may involve someone engaging in financial transactions without the knowledge of their partner. I can speak on this from personal experiences. Come on now, that, that right there is painful when you don't know what your partner's doing with their money. You don't know who they're giving their money to, loaning their money to, buying things that they shouldn't have bought. Right? So we have to have fidelity. We have to have commitment to each other when it comes to our finances. Because one wrong move can burn us off. Just like with sex. One wrong move. Your whole household can go down. Same thing with finances. We got to really think about who we are in bed with. What's worse about cheating is that many times the other partner has no idea what's going on. Their trust has blinded them to the possibility that their partner might be hurting them or lying to them. I remember getting my relationship, my husband understands, I said, I trust nobody. Trust is not given, it is earned. I'll, I'll look at you like, whatever, trust nobody. Just because I smile and I may seem like I'm aloof, don't mean I'm dumb. I'm far from a dumb woman. A lot of people get tricked by the smile. They get tricked. I'm like, oh, what do you mean? Because they say something that I, I definitely know what you mean, but I want you to tell me what you mean because I'm not stupid. Don't play no games. I want to hear it out your mouth. So when I ask you, if I'm asking you, nine out of ten times is I already know. You understand? So it's important that not only for that trust to be there, but the communication to be there. And if we're not asking questions, how are we going to know what our partners are doing with their money or our money or, or whatever? You understand? With your money. You have to have the conversations. You have to have agreements. In my household, there's a certain amount of money that we can spend that we don't need to talk to the other partner about. But when that involves giving it to somebody else, I want to know. Because now when examining the relationship with another person, who is this person, especially if I don't know them? Why are you giving money to them? That ain't a tie. It ain't no donation. Not a charity. I want to know. So I ask questions, even if it makes you uncomfortable. We should all have that kind of mindset. Because I don't want ever to be in a situation when a creditor is knocking on my door, or the IRS is knocking on my door, or let alone some gangsters knocking on the door, or putting a gun in my mouth or my kid's mouth. I want to know what you're doing. And we have to have these conversations so that we don't get blindsided or burnt. You can protect yourself from cheating. First and foremost, by asking questions. Many relationships have a silent partner which is almost never a good idea. By allowing someone to do as they choose without creating a sufficient level of communication, you are effectively putting yourself out of the loop and making yourself vulnerable. In most cases, there is enough trust in a relationship that being a silent partner is not a problem. But in many cases in which someone is unfaithful, whether it's financially, sexually, whatever the case is, it is because there was never sufficient communication in the first place. You better believe it. Because if you don't ask, who's going to tell? Right? It's a policy, right? Don't ask, don't tell. So when you're not asking your partner, when you're not conversing, not conversating people, not conversating, when you're not conversing with your partner, 
and having these discussion, money discussions, sex discussions, 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 discussion. What you're doing is giving the person permission to have free range over your life. Now, you can do whatever you want to do. You can cheat financially. You can cheat sexually. Do whatever you want to do. Tell me. I'm going to ask. Tell me. Tell me. And when I feel like you're not communicating the truth to me, I'm going to take precautions to safeguard myself sexually and financially because I can't trust you. Right? I can't trust you. And then I have to consider if I even want to be in a relationship with you. Because if I can't trust you, if I got to sleep with my eye open... Do I want to be in this relationship? It's the same idea when it comes to money. Same idea when it comes to money. If you cannot trust your partner with their money, with the household, do you want to remain in that relationship? It ain't nothing like coming home and there's an eviction notice on your door or a foreclosure notice on your door. I know people, I've treated people that this happened in their marriages. You come home and y'all got 48 hours to move. That's serious. But you have to ask questions. And if you are if you are the person who is being asked the questions, you have to set your ego aside. Because this is not about right or wrong. This is not about playing defense or offense. This is about our livelihood and our future. So we have to be on the same plane, the same page financially. When it comes to relationships and money. Because one wrong move, we all get burnt, right? Financial sex comparison number eight. Communication is the key to making the experience a good one. The key to good sex or physical, physical or financial is communication. If an individual cannot communicate his or her needs desires, expectations, and problems, then the process can be confusing and disappointing for both parties. What is the saddest? What is saddest is that many times the destruction that comes out of this confusion may have been easily avoided had both parties shared their concerns. Communication with your partner is critical. It and is something that must occur very early in the process of financial love. Not only must it occur early in the process, process, it must occur throughout the process as needs and changes, as needs and issues change through time. Communication not only enhances your ability to work together to reach financial goals, it also ensures that both parties are playing their role in the process. So that's very important. I, I already said it. We talked about communication. We talked about communication. So important, not just in the beginning of the relationship, but throughout the life of the relationship. When we fail to communicate, when we fail to ask questions, when we fail to answer questions that are asked, we're setting the relationship up for chaos, distrust, confusion, arguments, you name it, negative energy, period. This is not about somebody asking you a question and you ain't got to answer to nobody. Not if you want to be in a relationship, especially if you're going to be married. No, y'all do have to answer to each other. But if that is your mindset, I wonder how good is your relationship, right? But natural sex comparison number nine, and this is the last one, and I'm out, people. I got to go. I got to go. If done well, you can reach heights you never thought possible. So it's not all doom and gloom. There's good news to this too. Because if you follow the steps, if you communicate, if you go over each other's financial portfolios, you know everybody's credit, you know everybody's tangibles and intangibles, you know what the goals are, you have a relationship vision, you have trust, you're committed, you're, you have fidelity, and you guys are communicating on an ongoing basis. That is great love making. It makes for a wonderful relationship. But any of any piece of that component that is missing can lead to a disaster. It's all interconnected, right? But when you do it right, a relationship can be robust. It can be a beautiful thing. Marriage is not a bad thing. It's not if done correctly. If it's not done correctly, whether it's marriage or long-term relationship, whatever the case is, 
It can be a disaster even in a business relationship. If it's not done correctly, it can leave you broke, busted, and disgusted. All right? And any kind of lovemaking process should make you feel better than you felt before you chose to engage in the activity. If you don't feel better about your life after you've done the deed, then that was a waste of your time. If a person makes good financial love with you, you both walk away fulfilled. If everything on the table is communicated and you can see it and it looks good, it feels good, and even when it's not good, you guys work together to fix it, you can build that way. If you're not able to do that, you're going to have a relationship full of stress. And some people, is a lifetime full of stress. Generally, if the financial lovemaking process is done well, it's both amazing and fulfilling. The hard work necessary to make financial love throughout a lifetime may show itself in greater financial rewards for all parties involved. The key thing to remember is that you it must be done together and both parties must be on the same page. If you are disjointed emotionally from your partner, then you will not only find that there are mistakes, deceits, and misunderstandings you will find that the financial and emotional suffering will be both permanent and painful. Working together helps you to avoid many of the problems couples incur when they are not honest about money. So that was that chapter when we're talking about sex and money. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about getting the right body, getting the right body for financial sex. It's going to be exciting. So that's it. What I got for you guys today. I leave to go on my speaking engagement, which wish me luck. This is a person who found me. I don't know how, but um, I'm driving out there this morning to go speak to a group of women um, that are 40 to 70 years old. What do they want to hear from this young thing? But I got something to say. So I'm going out there to speak to them. Wish me luck. Tomorrow, I will be in Atlanta, Georgia. I'll be meeting with one of my book clubbers. Yay. So wish me luck on the plane as well. I leave. At like 2.50 this afternoon, and I'll be in Georgia. But I will wake up tomorrow with the book club. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. I love you all. Be blessed and have a marvelous, productive day.